This question is from decent Divan. Whoa. Respected Guruji, I am a Buddhist and a Vipassana practitioner. I have a question which I have asked many Vipassana teachers and other Gurus, but everybody said that no one can answer this. <laughs> in one of your video you mentioned, and also it is said in Buddhism, that rebirth is due to our unfulfilled desire or karma. I accept this, but then a question arises, let us suppose I took birth for millions of times because of my karma desire, but before my very first birth, there was no body, no mind, karma desire or nothing of me existed. Then why and how that very first birth came to existence? Now. Uh even I'm wondering about that about you <laughs> Well, <laughs> no, you are a decent guy, I'm like this, what to do? <laughs> Let's take that question further back. It's not just about your birth. Well, in the yogic culture, there are theories which are explained in the form of dialectical stories, how uh, Shiva was like Shava. Shava means a corpse, he was inert, phenomenal energy but inert. Then energy or Shakti came and danced around him, upon him, then he got kind of woke up. Well, we are, uh, you know, picturizing it as a man and a woman, but that's not what we're talking about. Inert means nothing happening, no reverberation. No reverberation means no creation. Energy got introduced, reverberation started. From a simple basic reverberation, it got more and more complex. As reverberations became more complex, it became matter. Matter became small molecules, they became planets, planets became many things, life happened, variety of things, you know the evolutionary theory from there on. Evolutionary theory only starts after life has started or at the beginning probably, but if you go back, creation itself, we may not know the exact trajectory of how it happened, but we approximately know how it happened even as per modern science. So in the modern scientific parlance, the same thing is said today that if you apply energy, not even into it, just around it, suppose you create vacuum in a container and apply energy not into the vacuum, just around it, uh, virtual protons and virtual neutrons will erupt. That means creation begins to happen. Proton, neutron uh, just have to get together for an atom to happen. Once an atom has happened, creation has started. So similar things are said in modern science. I don't want to go into any theories, but obviously creation began somewhere. Somewhere means it may not be within the projections of human mind in terms of time, because it's not one. But in the yogic system, there have been estimates that there have been eighty-four creations till now, eighty-three creations till now, this is the eighty-fourth one. And up to one hundred and twelve cycles of creation can happen. Beyond that, creation will be material-free, just pure energy creation. But we're talking in terms of maybe billions of years or trillions of years, I don't know. But those projections are made. Well, obviously it's just a theory. Nobody can prove or disprove anything about it. But it looks like a plausible theory because the markings of eighty-three creations are there in our system in various aspects of life around us. The markings of eighty-three and this being eighty-four 
are there for those who look very closely at it. So how did you, such a decent guy, happen? Well, so this question doesn't go that far as I took it just now. It's talking about if I did not have karmic substance, how did I happen? That's a question. Well, you don't need a spiritual answer, Charles Darwin himself has explained this. You were a single-celled creature and then you became two-cell, then you became three-cell, then you became multi-cell. Now you become little more, little more only, decently better. A decent development from a single cell has happened. <laughs> so, in the process from the single celled animal, from an atom to a molecule, right now this is a wonderful time to ask this question because there is virus. A virus is not a full-fledged life. It has proteins and enzymes to make it a life, but it's not yet life. Only when it enters your cell, it has a life. But in… by itself, it has no life, just a certain combo of protein. So decent… Uh, what? Dushyanta. An Divan. So you were also pre-life, became life, became more and more complex life. Complexity itself is karma. Karma is not necessarily, even now as you sit here, karma is not necessarily only what you do like this. The thoughts that pass in your mind are karma, emotions that pass in your mind right now are karma. Simply, a thought just passed in your mind. You looked at the person next to you, thought, why is he here? He should be on the roof with the monkeys. <laughs> Just like that, you know, sometimes thought like this, come, hello. So this karma just happened inadvertently, not caused by you, caused by the monkeys dancing on the roof. So because monkeys came there, you looked at this guy, at a certain angle he looked a certain way to you. <laughs> maybe it's the lighting, maybe it's the way he sat, maybe something and a thought came and went. Now you performed a karma. That somewhere you look at another human being and you think he's a monkey. Now this won't stop here, you understand? Now you looked at him and thought you're a monkey. Tomorrow, we changed your department and you're in the monkey department. <laughs> oh my God, I have to work with this monkey today. It will continue. And if suppose the situations are placed like that, he is in charge of the department, you have to work under him. Do I have to be instructed by a monkey like this? it will grow. And this is how you became a racist, <laughs> all right? <laughs> because initially it's just a passing thought. Then depending on situations, how they corner you here, there, there, slowly it multiplies. This is even happening to every other creature. So gradually, karmic substance builds up, builds up, becomes more and more complex. Well, clearly, Evolutionary sciences are telling us the initial human beings were very, very simple, half-bent human beings, very small brain, they couldn't think much, they just survived like any other creature. Everybody knows that, right? So from there you built your karma. I don't know why nobody could answer this question for you, everybody knows this. Maybe they thought you are not worth answering. Because uh, I am such a fool, I don't think anybody is not worth answering. Because I don't think any question is not worth answering, I am taking all kinds of idiotic questions from all over the world <laughs> So, 
This is also because maybe you have some conclusion of your own, it's not really a question, you're testing everybody with your question, so they might have said, this happened. A committed, uh, you know, marijuana is legal in many states in the United States. So as a man who is committed to this, because a lot of people are approaching it like a philosophy, it is not just a compulsion that they have, it's a philosophy, we smoke, so we are superior to you. Yes. There is something called as endocannabinoids that you can generate within your own body. That means whatever the cannabis does, you can do it in your brain and your body. That is why cannabis receptors are there. Because you are a malfunctioning system, you're not able to generate your own thing. See, right now, suppose you are not able to secrete enough uh, thyroid juices, then they will put thyroid into your system. You're not able to produce enough hormones in your system, they will put hormone into your system. You're not able to produce enough insulin in your system, they put insulin into your system. Similarly, because for some reason you are a malfunctioning machine, that you're not able to produce your endocannabinoids and be blissed out, you're putting from outside. But the difference between endocannabinoids that you generate and you're blissed, and outside one also may cause some bliss, but it also causes certain dislocation of your intelligence. Never before has it happened that someone who is blissed out because of his meditative nature ever left off a mountain and thought he's going to fly. But many smokers and LSD takers and drug takers have done this. So, uh, this committed, uh, in US these days they're calling themselves stoners. <laughs> Back to Stone Age. I am also stoned but not a stoner, just stoned. So, uh, he called the fire brigade and said, my house is on fire, just come quickly. How do I get there? The fireman asked. Come on, get into the big red truck and get here. <laughs> what to do? What to do? So right now, you're wasting your time very indecently. Because these are all questions of the vein. Because mainly your questioning is towards whoever those, I don't know who are those people that you ask questions. In some way you want to make a fool out of them. That's all you're interested in. You're not interested in knowing anything about yourself. You're not interested in having tools for your transformation or growth. You said you went for vipassana. Tch. Vipassana means no questions. <laughs> Simple instruction, just do it, do it, do it and do it. Because that is a process which demands perseverance as the greatest quality. Gautama thought vipassana to large groups of people because there was no time to prepare them. He was every day moving from village to village, town to town, no time to bring understanding into those people. So no teaching, no question, just simple instruction. Get the instruction right, just do it, do it, do it. Slowly it will transform you. It's a... a very... a bit of... a bit laborious process but a fantastic process that even if you have no clue what you're doing, if you just do it, slowly it will transform who you are. When I say transform you, every aspect of you, including your chemistry, gradually it will transform. It's a laborious process because in those times, you must understand he was teaching twenty-five hundred years ago. Twenty-five hundred years ago, the common wavelength of the society was not intellectual understanding. The common wavelength of the society which lived hard lives was perseverance, people could persevere. 
Today, to make them persevere, you have to talk to them for hours and hours and hours because they think they understand everything. Those days people had no such problems, they knew that they don't understand. So you had to just <laughs> you had to just instruct them and say, do it. And uh, those were good times for the gurus. <laughs> because if you give an instruction and say, you must do it, you just do it. You know, my mother, some yogi in Nandi Hill, she, she once we went to Nandi Hills and she showed me the cave where she was initiated. She gave... Uh, he, that yogi gave her some mantra, I don't know who he is anyway. And she never had a picture or she wouldn't even talk, uh, you know, utter his name. But every day she did something with eyes closed. Right through our li life, we've been her life. You know, four children, husband is her life. She married at the age of seventeen and that's her life. But before that, she was initiated and this yogi told her, whatever happens with your life, you must do it every day. Every day she is doing something with her eyes closed. We say, what are you doing? Say, well, this yogi gave me a mantra, I just do it. We want to know what's the mantra. So we played all kinds of tricks on her, tried to compel her emotionally, uh, what, blackmail her. You tell us this mantra. Such a gentle and easy person to deal with, always she was. But uh, not once, no matter what, either to her husband or to her children, she ever told the mantra because the yogi said, you don't share this with anybody. I mean to say, it was so easy to instruct them. If I tell you, keep this to yourself, you'll put it on the social media. <laughs> so, because giving instruction was very effective and simple in the previous generations, especially twenty-five hundred years ago, Gautama chose this path, no understanding, no teaching, obviously no questioning, just do it. Only to those who gathered around him, who traveled with him, who were in close uh, association with him, to them he taught shunya because that needs understanding. Without bringing substantial understanding, that won't happen. So you went to Vipassana, that means you must just shut up and do it not ask this question, that question, because that question will... Uh, that question or the answer will not in any way add to your practice. The practice has been designed in such a way, irrespective of who you are, if you do it, it will work. It's just that it's a bit laborious, you have to do it for hours every day, for a long period of time, but it will work, it's a fantastic device for those times. Even now it is for a whole lot of people. So, don't waste your time. The decent thing for you to do is... <laughs> if you're here, I don't know where you are. If you're here, take instructions and just do it. Otherwise, stick to the vipassana and do it. One way or the other, take one forward step. Rather than standing in the same place and looking all over the place, it won't add to your life in any way. It's just that in foolishness you will think you're smart by gathering these things. Maybe now I've said what I've said, you will go and tell somebody else, you know what Sadhguru said, this is what it is, even he doesn't know. <laughs> or you will make it your answer and put it on the social media. Whatever you do, it's of no use. Existentially, if you want to move on, you must do something existential within you. You do psychological things and you think you will move on, you will not. You know what is my handicap? You want to know? Simply, being straight and honest is my big handicap. Yes, 
no deviousness, this is my handicap, what do you think? Tell me, Sadhguru, it's not a handicap. Hey! Some of my advisors think this is a handicap, I'm too straight and blunt about too many things. But that's the way I will be. If you don't like it, 